Well, thank you, everyone. We still have uh, some additional uh, components of the program to share with you. Very shortly, you will hear from our three panelists who will talk about global philanthropy from their own unique vantage points. Uh, but before we do that, I just wanted to give another round of applause to our conversation that we just had. I thought it's a great way to continue our evening. Okay, so I'm going to invite them to join us up here, uh, starting with Dr. Carol Edelman. Yes. Okay. And then uh, Paris to Yousefi. And then Doug Ritson. I will give uh, very brief bios and then we'll jo join the conversation. Seems to be out in the water. Oh. Okay, so many of you know her. Great. Uh, many of you know our panelists. You've uh, seen them, you've heard about their work. So I'll just give very, very quick bios. I'll start with Dr. Carol Edelman. You've already heard amazing things about Carol, but I will say just personally from knowing her, she served in many senior administrative roles at USAID. She founded the two global indices. She's the director of the um, Center for Global Prosperity here at Hudson, but she is also a, a faculty member now at the Lilly Family School, one of my colleagues. And I have to say, um, she's the most amazing uh, mentor, leader, and very generous with her time. You heard about philanthropy, and she really embodies the spirit of philanthropy. So Carol, thank you for being here. Uh, Paris, too, is another amazing leader. Um, you're going to hear why we think so highly of her. She's a rock star in the philanthropy field globally. Uh, her title is Senior Program Officer at the Gates Foundation. But I've come to know uh, Paris Tu's wisdom because she works in countries around the world. And in each of them, she has a unique understanding of how policy works, what role philanthropy plays, and how we can improve philanthropy globally. So she'll be sharing some of that. Uh, Doug Rudson, I think their bios are also should be available as well. Doug Rudson is the CEO of the International Center for Nonprofit Law, ICNL. Uh, ICNL has affiliates around the world, and he also serves on our advisory board. Uh, Doug um, is very passionate about this topic. Um, one of his uh, phrases that I have I've benefited from his wisdom is around the closing space for civil society globally. So he'll share that vantage point with us. And then he'll also share the on the ground uh, reports that he's been reading and, and learning about. Um, Doug also wears many hats, is also a faculty member at Georgetown Law School right here in Washington, DC. So with that as a brief introduction, we're gonna jump right into the panel and we'll also have some time to take questions from the audience. So keep your questions coming. We're going to start with Carol, and I'm going to ask Carol to kind of think back a little bit to 2015 when you first developed the indices, and then think about how the world has changed since then. What are the changes you're seeing around global philanthropy? Um, any positives that are emerging? What about any negative uh, aspects, uh, challenges to the environment that you're seeing? What has changed since 2015, I guess, is a simple way to phrase that. Well, thank you, and I, I don't, I won't, I know we all can't thank everybody, but I have to <laughs> again. So I want to thank uh, Ken Weinstein for always helping and being supportive of the indices, and Sean Kelly and our, our great staff here at Hudson for, you know, pro providing the venue and all the logistics. And of course to Amir and you and your wonderful staff and scholars who have put together such great research. And um, you've really enhanced the index with so, on so many ways. And it was just what, what I had dreamed of. <laughs> so thanks so much. And to our great speakers who have already left us. So I can, I can minimize those thank you. <laughs> because they, I'll thank them separately. Um, and then I it would be remiss not to be thanking our great panelists. And these two people here are just on the front lines of freedom and civil society and telling us what's happening and helping countries move along and in giving their time uh, and, and resources through the Gates Foundation to make changes in, in, in the practice of philanthropy, which is, which is very, very hard. So um, what has changed, what hasn't? Well, I'm gonna, some of the big 
the trends that we saw in 2015 were um, the, uh, the rules and regulations, uh, had, more of them had been um, put forth, and Doug, that was from your paper, and what we were hearing from our country experts over the last, you know, from, we were measuring really from about 2014 to 20, 2015. And there were more restrictions. The beginning of foreign agent laws were coming in, uh, where a, if you were getting foreign donations from uh, particularly the U.S. or any other place, you would be you, you would be designated a foreign agent, which would give the government that government started with Russia um, the opportunity to go through your books, to shut you down, or whatever. So Doug's going to talk a lot more about that. We also had the um, illicit financial flows legislation, which is a, sort of this topic that I had never really heard of that our Treasury very much manages. And because we ask our experts to say, tell us what, when you talk to people in the country and from your perspective, what is really you know, bogging you down? And the illicit financial flows were because we, we, our Treasury Department has to put re restraints and they have to be very careful about what money is going overseas. And it's for a good reason, so that it isn't funding terrorists. Um, it was creating um, requirements for smaller P uh, smaller NGOs that they were making it hard to you know, hard to deal with. And the Treasury didn't want that to happen, but they needed to do it. So I know that they were working on a lot of changes, and I'll be anxious to hear if you think. But that that was creating one of the um, the biggest things. The other thing was just foreign exchange laws and capital controls. Um, you know, it was just bringing money in, not being able to exchange it, the black markets and the capital controls on what you could do were, were those all, all of those together that I just mentioned were the ones that were, they said were creating the most problems. We didn't hear a lot about tax incentives. Mm -hmm. And I was noticing even in some of the countries in 2015 um, that had um, lower scores, they were still um, doing pretty good tax credits and tax incentives. So, and that was that surprised me. Um, so, uh, th that was, that's just sort of a nutshell. And I'd be really interested to hear from you all what you found, and in particular where how Doug thinks it may have changed from then too. Very good. So Doug has a very different hat from Carol's. He wasn't necessarily involved with the 2015 data collection, but he now leads and has led this comprehensive project that looks at how civil society is evolving in nations around the world. The narrative coming out of that is actually very discouraging. The phrase you hear often is this closing space. Uh, civil society leaders are experiencing more constraints. Uh, that is related to philanthropy, but not always the same as philanthropy. So Doug, similar to Carol, what has changed? What do you see as kind of what's now and what's next in the horizon for civil society organizations and for private philanthropy? Well, thank you for that question. Also, I thank Indiana University for this important project. And Carol Peristu, it's an honor to be on the panel with you. First, the data. If you look since 2012, data. 60 countries have enacted 90 laws that directly affect civil society and philanthropy. So 60 countries, 90 laws. How does that break down in terms of restrictive laws versus enabling laws? Three quarters of the laws restrict civil society or philanthropy. One quarter, enable it. Now, when we look at restrictions, it's not really mild restrictions, not administrative restrictions. What we're really talking about is the government deciding that they have a better view than citizens about what kinds of organizations should be permitted in society. So for example, under a new law in Cambodia, the government has virtually unbridled discretion to decide whether you can, you often hear the word register, that's a civil law term for incorporate, whether you can register or incorporate a nonprofit in that country. In Bahrain, the government gets to decide whether society needs the association. So what they do is they displace citizens in this paternalistic, we know better than you what kinds of organizations you want. So as a result, what we see is a lot of restrictions around the ability to form or operate groups. The second basket of restrictions 
relate to cross-border funding, an issue you know, that you presented in the key findings. So again, whether it be Egypt or Azerbaijan or India, the government says, we get to decide whether you can send money over to a group in our country, whether or not they're engaged in helping children, engaged in public health, education, or other issues. Now, some of you will say, yeah, but I've heard this story before. What's new? Three things are new. One, particularly in countries that we consider to be traditionally very closed, there's actually a little bit of an opening emerging. Now, when I say this, some will say, but this makes no sense. Saudi Arabia, a country that's been traditionally quite closed. We'll see how the law plays out, but there's actually been positive developments, a new law on associations and foundations, and groups are forming there. China, so wait a minute, how could this be? China actually has passed legislation that enables the formation of domestic charity groups. What's interesting about it as well is that they're encouraging these groups to work internationally. Why? The One Belt, One Road initiative. They actually want domestic charities to be engaging in the One Belt, One Road initiative. And even for international philanthropies that want to engage in China, they're informally approaching these groups saying, you know what, we might let you operate in China if you help our domestic charities engage internationally. Which leads me to point two, which is that we hear that maybe there's a little more room for domestic philanthropy or the outflow of philanthropy. More and more countries are restricting the inflow of philanthropy. You probably have been following just these days developments in Hungary. My friend said, you would think George Soros is running for president because during the recent elections, more pictures and billboards of George Soros were on the street than Viktor Orban. Or Australia, which currently is debating a bill that would ban a nonprofit from receiving any foreign funding if they'll use the funding to express public views on any issue that might ever come before a voter. So in other words, anything. <laughs> yeah. Or six bills in the US Congress that would enhance for enforcement of our US Foreign Agents Registration Act. Some serious concerns that we need to grapple with. Many of you might not be aware, but under the 1938 Foreign Agents Registration Act, that if a foreign foundation disperses any money in the United States, the US person that disperses that funds, those funds, whether it be a nonprofit or an individual, must register as a foreign agent here in the US under a criminal penalty if you don't. Many people think it's the Russians that created the foreign agents law. It was the US before World War II. Which leads me to the final point. What else is new? we're finding a very interesting relationship between transparency requirements and closing space. We all think transparency, it's a good thing. Brandeis said, sunlight's the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. But we can't forget, sunlight can also give you a sunburn. And what we find <laughs> is that governments are using transparency to restrict civic space. One example, Ukraine. A lot of allegations of corruption in that country. The government's quite concerned about being investigated. So what did it do? It said, if you're a nonprofit and you're engaged in anti-corruption, every staff member must publicly disclose their income and assets. Why? Because they know that's going to chill a lot of organizations from engaging in these activities. So it's a pretty complex field. There are some negative developments, but also some positive developments. And I think that's the beauty of the index, because it adds that nuance. It's not binary, but rather there's this continuum. Excellent. Thank you so much, Doug. I think this was exactly what we needed. Now, we just heard also from Henrietta Four at UNICEF the scale of the issues that UNICEF is grappling with, whether it's the refugee crises, natural disasters, healthcare needs, education needs. These are just multiple dimensions as well as very costly in terms of resources. And so you often hear that one actor alone, whether it's government or a philanthropy or a business, cannot do it on their own. And the need for collaboration keeps coming up. So I want to turn to Paris to in her role, she's had the opportunity to see 
on the ground how collaboration works around the world. So I wanted you to perhaps talk about some of those examples that you're seeing. And then if you can, touch on the countries because you also know what's going on at the country level. So Doug mentioned Saudi Arabia, India. What's going on? What's driving the changes that we're seeing? Why are governments becoming, in some parts of the world, more receptive to the role of philanthropy? Sure. Um, well, thank you, Dr. Osili, for um, having me here and for this important conversation. Um, thank you to Indiana University and Hudson Institute. I remember meeting Carol a few years ago before the first index was published, and it's just been so great to see ex its expansion over the years and now under Indiana's leadership. Um, so I'm particularly excited about the number of emerging market countries and emerging donor market countries as part of this year's um, index. Um, so I work with our philanthropic partnerships team at the Gates Foundation, and our mission is to increase the size and quality of philanthropy globally. Um, and we are not just concerned with fundraising for our own issue areas, but rather we care about growing the size of the philanthropy pie more generally. And why is that? Um, as has been mentioned a couple times, um, there's just simply not enough money to achieve all the sustainable development goals. Um, there's not enough foreign aid, and there's not enough philanthropy. Um, so it's going to take blends of capital, all forms of capital, in order to achieve these goals. Um, and one example that I like to share, because I think it's such a success, and its model is one that um, you know, hopefully can, can be replicated more often, is the story of Gavi. So Gavi is um, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization and was created in 2000 uh, in order to, uh, to solve a need at the time, which was to immunize 30 million children who didn't have access to vaccines that you and I and our children have. Um, and the, uh, brought together the partnership and the beauty of Gavi really brought together vaccine manufacturers, uh, donor governments, development, developing country governments, uh, um, private capital, uh, philanthropic capital, technical and research institutes, UNICEF, WHO, um, so really a multi-stakeholder uh, initiative. The Gates Foundation put up the initial risk capital, so $750 million over five years. Um, uh, and the, you know, the, not just the, the resources that have been mobilized, but also the technical expertise um, that has been brought in order to make vaccines more affordable and accessible. And the results have been outstanding. 640 million children immunized since, 9 million deaths averted, health systems in over 60 countries strengthened. Um, and one study found that for every dollar invested in immunizations, um, there's an $18 return in terms of healthcare cost savings, um, uh, lost wages um, due to illness, uh, loss of productivity. So I think you know, Gavi is a great example. Um, and it's not just vaccines. Um, we're also applying the same model to family planning. Um, so working with a range of pharmaceutical companies and public and private um, sector actors to bring contraceptives to 120 million women um, in over 69 countries by the year 2020. Um, another success story, as Doug alluded to, and I guess I would call it success with a few asterisks, caveats, <laughs> we'll see, to be determined, um, are these kind of new, potentially shining examples in China and in Saudi Arabia. Um, both countries in the last couple of years passed draft charity laws. And I say draft because they had been drafted over 10 years prior and both sat dormant for a very long time. And interestingly, they passed them within a couple years of each other. No relationship, but um, an interesting, uh, interesting timing. Um, and what's interesting is the law, both in both countries, the laws on the books versus what's happening in practice. Um, we've seen in both countries a number of NGOs registered increase. Um, which is great, but you know, caveat number one, very narrow focus on poverty alleviation, um, the provision of social services, obviously not much rights-based or anything critical of government. Um, second is we've seen in China um, and in India an, a bit of an opening of laws in terms of online giving platforms, 
which has resulted in, as you've mentioned before, Dr. Osili, um, this rise in um, online crowdfunding. We've got this kind of rise in the global middle class. You've got this rise in technology, um, the adoption and adaptation in different countries. And so you're seeing this increase in online giving, which is really exciting. Um, in China on September 9th, their 9-9 day, which is their charity day equivalent to our Giving Tuesday here in the US, $200 million was raised in a single day, which is a five-fold increase from two years prior, its founding year. And so hopefully will continue to increase. But caveat too, um, as these new kind of laws are introduced, and as Doug mentioned, increasing restrictions on foreign funding, on the receipt of foreign funds, and even on the you know, spending, the dispersion of them across borders. Um, and this is what we've been seeing more and more in, in a few countries, is a loosening of restrictions domestically, but then a tightening uh, when it comes to cross-border giving. And I'll just briefly mention on cross-border giving, one of the, the driving causes of the restriction, well, there's many reasons, um, but as Carol mentioned on illicit financial flows, is the laws around um, to combat money laundering and terrorist financing is having unintended consequences on nonprofit financial access um, and on um, humanitarian aid and relief. And, you know, there needs, after 9-11, there needs to be a reassessment. And many advocates are pushing for a risk-based approach. It can't just be, you know, it, it's a very delicate balance. Um, but these, you know, regulations are really impeding on nonprofits' financial access. And, you know, you've got the banks and the regulators and the policymakers all pointing their fingers at each other. And, you know, so we're supporting an initiative now um, led by the World Bank, which is really trying to bring all these different stakeholders together to address these issues. Doug leads one of the work streams to potentially um, mainstream some of the due diligence um, uh, efforts that uh, nonprofits have to respond to, uh, to banks. And so this is a, a huge threat, and I think it'll only increase. Hopefully, it could be um, next year's time as another success story we share. Fantastic. Well, there's so much that we could talk about, but I'm going to ask each panelist to actually restrict. I'm going to ask them one question, but they have to give uh, answers to two uh, particular issues. So as we look across the world, we've had our entire team has read through these country reports, regional reports, and the global reports. And so we're seeing the rise of crowdfunding. We're also seeing a lot of interest in impact investing, blended capital, new forms of philanthropy. And at the same time, we're seeing these same regulatory uh, constraints that are emerging. So as you look ahead, uh, what are Maybe one is, what would be your wish list for how we could improve the philanthropic environment? So think about what, what could be a game changer. We heard about accelerators from our panelists. Um, what would be something that could really dramatically improve the way that philanthropy is conducted to actually grow the pie so that we have the resources that we need to solve the world's most pressing problems? So that's one uh, thing to think about. And then the second is, what is the biggest threat that you see on the landscape? So we want something to be optimistic about, of course, but also to think about how all of us can play a role in helping to meet the challenges ahead. So I, I'm not sure where to start, but maybe Doug will start with you because uh, you certainly know the regulatory environment very well. So there are two sides. What are the greatest opportunities? What are the yep. greatest threats? I'll give one answer. It's technology. It's the answer to both. Mm -hmm. And what I would say is in terms of the greatest opportunity, if you look at artificial intelligence, we had a meeting on that on Friday, and a colleague from Microsoft took out his cell phone and he pointed it at the crowd and he said, we have something called seeing AI. Not seeing AI, but seeing AI. And what you can do is you can point it at a can and a blind person can tell whether it's a can of corn or a can of beans or the expiration date on milk. That it's tremendously empowering for our friends who are visually impaired and blind. And there's philanthropic dollars that are going in to artificial intelligence. And I started to think about that because the same morning I was reading about the situation at a concert in China, you may have seen this. There was a fellow who went to a concert, 60,000 people, and Chinese authorities arrested the one person in the crowd who was a criminal. They were able to identify him through 
facial recognition technology. And you can basically realize that technology and AI is a dual use technology. And we need to figure out ways that we can harness it for good, but also be part of a conversation about the future development of AI and technology to help manage and mitigate some of the risks that I think are inherent in that. Very good, thank you. Um, Carol, do you want to go next? <laughs> sure, sure. On threats, I do think that um, you know we've seen certainly a rise in authoritarian governments, and I'm, I'm sort of keying off the Freedom House report. I'm on the board of Freedom House, where we've had, and this is really, we thought after the Cold War, um, you know, and we had done a lot in in reducing totalitarianism and liberal democracies were really pushing forward and Frank Fukuyama, it's the end of history. And, and all of a sudden now we're seeing, you know, that rise and Freedom House has, they've shown that over from 2006 to now, it's roughly 12 years, that 113 countries have become less free and whereas only 62 countries have become more free. So in other words, we feel like and we're seeing this on attacks on free and fair elections, on freedom of the press, um, on rule of law, and in, in the formation of NGOs and all of that. So, I and so what do we do about that? I mean, uh, I think that every organization really has to uh, be out there. I, I, it, certainly, our multilateral agencies. I think it's going to be no problem with Henrietta at the UN, and our government agencies have to be encouraging these types, funding these types of programs. The private sector really probably, you know, foundations need to get in. We've just got to be able to, you know, teach the elements of liberal democracies and um, more and more conferences. And I think, too, the whole theory of the index was um, that this whole idea of indicator-based competition. And this is what we have in the World Bank report on doing business. And so if you measure countries, and compare them and then publicize the heck out of that, that is a way that you can improve things. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we hope with this index of uh, philanthropy, of, of global, the Global Environment Index now, which is a, a great new name, will do. By, and it isn't like a, it, you, people used to call that a name and shame, <laughs> but it's a way what I like about it is once you see, because it, your, your measures are very detailed, What's the tax credit for this? What's the cap? And what are the regulations? And this is something that once you see what the problem is, the solution is obvious. So to the extent that we can get this out there and you can have comparative data over the years um, uh, and we can, I think that will help philanthropy grow because then governments can see, hey, this is what we, we need to do. And hopefully we can get, you know, the restrictive countries together with the um, uh, favorable countries and let them share ideas and just just put put a bigger push on it because I think it's a big threat now. Um, yeah, I'm really uh, excited about, most excited about the opportunity for online giving platforms in these emerging donor market countries. Um, there's there are obviously huge populations and um, any more resources that can be mobilized there um, would be a significant addition to this larger philanthropic pie. I'm also excited about the potential with diaspora giving. Um, a study by Dahlberg found that um, there is about a two to three hundred million dollar giving gap each year from the Indian diaspora community alone from four markets, the US, UK, Singapore, um, and the UAE. And so just thinking about that, and since most of their giving is directed back home to India, it seems like a great opportunity to seize um, and thinking about these cross-border flows. Um, and then a threat, again, these restrictions on foreign funding, so we really can't mobilize this diaspora, this diaspora philanthropy and giving if countries like India have implement extremely strict rules on the, the receipt of foreign funds. Um, and so again, I really encourage everyone, please find me afterwards if you're interested in some of this work being led by the World Bank and others, please come and find me um, to see how we can get you involved. Um, I know it's not the most 
you know, exciting topic, but um, these anti-money laundering and counter-terrorist financing um, regulations are really having unintended consequences on nonprofits. So. Okay, so I'm going to try to summarize very quickly what these opportunities are. You heard it from Doug. One opportunity, one challenge, technology. How can we harness technology to solve these problems? You heard from Carol, data. Data is where the solution lies. We can use data to move and mobilize policy. We can encourage this indicator-based competition. Data is the tool, really, to solve the problem. And with Paris, too, you heard about a mix, a hybrid solution, really, at the power of online giving, crowdfunding, and unleashing the diaspora uh, potential. And I certainly agree with you on all of those points. I think the, the very last um, point, we wouldn't want to end this panel without inviting all of you to ask questions. And we've kind of uh, provided I think there's some mics at the back if anyone would like to ask a question or even just say what you think might be the biggest challenge and opportunity um, as we prepare the index, if there are questions you would like to ask um, to our country experts in the future, we can incorporate them as well. So uh, let's, we have someone holding the mic in the background. If anyone has any questions. Yes, I see a question here. Yeah, why was so much of uh, Saharan Africa very good. So I have, I have to say, I grew up in Nigeria, so my goal is actually to cover the whole continent. The challenge we faced was really identifying country experts in those countries. And now we have a, a network that we've built of existing country experts and recently hosted fellows from Sub-Saharan Africa. So I think in the next round, we'll be able to fill those gaps. In some cases, we identified the country experts, but they, we didn't get the reports done in time or the data collected in time in other countries uh, where there's civil unrest or there's some other sort of uh, issue there, we weren't able to identify a country expert. So this is a topmost issue for us at the Lilly Family School. We certainly want full coverage of the continent. And I'm also very pleased to say that uh, the top economies on the continent are represented, Nigeria, Senegal, um, we have uh, South Africa, Zimbabwe was also another country where we included for the first time. So we're making headway, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done. I see, yes, Sam Worthington here. Um, front. So there's a trend in the US, uh, which is for the first time we're seeing a decline in individual philanthropic giving, which is, due to a demographic trend. So we're seeing less 50-year-olds around. It won't be until 2042 that we'll see the same level of 50-year-olds. So that we're seeing this dip in giving. The other trend we're seeing in the US is the very affluent individuals parking their wealth in donor-advised funds. And those funds are not being dispersed at the same level as if those resources were coming from the middle class. Is the, are these uniquely US trends, or do you think we'll see similar demographic trends in other places around the world? And also around for the super rich giving, we tend to focus on them, but they're actually less generous in terms of percentage than the general population. Um, so I don't know if these trends are something you're catching elsewhere. Yeah, I'll speak for the US because we have the most comprehensive data for the US. I think this is a very important trend that you've identified, so, but it's really to explain to the audience the fraction of US households that are giving is declining, and it's a significant decline, and it's mostly because of demographic displacement, but also because of a decline in religious attendance and so forth. So let's put that aside. At the same time, we have an increase in giving dollars. So among the people who do give, the dollars have stayed the same or have increased. So it's what we call donors down but dollars up, or at least dollars holding steady. And so this is an important trend. We don't necessarily see this in other parts of the world. Russia being an example, there's been a rise in giving, especially from middle class donors. And in many emerging economies, we're seeing young people being very interested in philanthropy. We don't have the comprehensive data 
in these other countries that we do for the US. So in some ways, it's not a very accurate comparison. But our goal, really, at the Lilly Family School is to increase the understanding of philanthropy globally. And so we would like to have, eventually, the kinds of data that we have for the US around the world so that we can make these uh, more rigorous comparisons over time. I don't know if other panelists want to jump in. Yeah, I would just add that for um, online giving in China and India, it's actually very much being driven by young people, I believe, under the age of 40. And so that's a trend um, that will probably likely to continue. My colleague, uh, Victoria Vrana, who's here, leads that work, um, that initiative, Giving by All. And you know, I'm sure she can share a lot more facts and data. Um, but absolutely, that demographic trend leaning more towards um, you know, I mean, I hate using millennial and plus um, <laughs> is, is absolutely the case, especially in these emerging donor market countries. We found that too in the 2015 index that it was a, a much, we don't have the exact numbers on it, but certainly we, we, we saw it a lot in our country when we did the index of global philanthropy and remittances that, that younger people were more involved and that it was more hands-on. They didn't just want to write a check, they wanted to be a part of it. And that um, there was a loyalty to getting the job done, the project, versus a loyalty to an institution. You know, like we have family members that have always, my family members always gave to care or save the children or, you know, a, a group that we all, that people like to give to. But with a lot of these younger donors and the donors that we were seeing in developing countries, they just, they didn't care if they were working with governments or businesses or whatever. They just, they wanted to, you know, it eliminate the problem and not just mm -hmm. keep having to write a check at the end of every grant, which is a good thing to, to, to see, actually. Doug, did you want to jump in on any of those? It's a, it's a great question. And I think what we may see is that, again, technology will open up new forms of giving. And what I'm thinking about particularly is electronic payment mechanisms like Apple Pay. Right now, you're able to actually donate directly to a certain number of charities. But it won't be too long before what we'll see is certain groups, let's say a soup kitchen, that does something like a rounding up campaign. And they say, every time you go to a restaurant, if it costs $30.80, let's use the change for good. And you program Apple Pay that it will give 20 cents I love it. to a soup kitchen or to your favorite charity. And instead of giving Tuesday, you might have giving Tuesdays. Every Tuesday, you would round up to the nearest Dollar. Now, it's not economical right now to transfer 20 cents to Feeding America because the stamp costs more. But through electronic payment mechanisms, we reduce transaction costs. So I can imagine that we may be on the verge of micro giving at high volume, which will be particularly attractive to certain demographics. I think we had a hand up here. Yes. Hi, Ann Hobson, Mercatus Center. Uh, my question has to do, the index, you mentioned the socioeconomic piece of it, um, and you mentioned generosity, so the culture of giving. My question is, do you also uh, consider the culture of receiving? Sometimes that's not seen as a good thing, and that could be a barrier to um, philanthropy. Very good. So you raise a very important point. One of the uh, questions, we actually have a faculty member at the Lilly School that has a course uh, that focuses on the politics of receiving assistance. It's not just about giving, but it's also about being able to receive Professor Lane Benjamin. And just an amazing set of uh, theoretical concepts and also practical issues that you focus on, on the giver side a lot, but what about receiving assistance? Now, what we see in the report, and I just want to highlight that because I, I know that eventually you'll all see this information, is we get to hear the voices of the country experts. And really, what was clear to me is in addition to technology, in fact, investing all of these new trends, there are also some underlying and time immemorial concepts like trust and legitimacy and organizations that can build that trust with uh, donors and their stakeholders are able to engage their supporters and their donors in kind of that long-term relationship building to solve problems. So ultimately, I think that's a challenge for the philanthropic sector globally is to continue to build the trust and the legitimacy in the work that we're doing. And there are a lot of tools that can help uh, continue to do that. And technology can certainly be a tool that helps as well. So we have lots of hands up, and I want to make sure we get at least a few of them. Yes.
question, you know, government giving is always like three birds would be giving and then a third is still in profit. Why do you think it's taken so long to see a shift in that? I, I know there's been an up movement for sure, but why do you think it's taken so long? Let's take a few questions and then the panelists can all respond, but that's an excellent one. Yes. So my question is, how do you think the improvement of education on philanthropy um, is like influencing or developing the work of um, global philanthropy? So like, I feel like in my understanding, I feel these days there's a huge improvement on the understanding of the value, both academic, philosophical value of philanthropy in people's life and civic society and the value of philanthropy in the role of modern society. So how do you, do you have, like, how do you have data to quantify this influence? How do you see, how do you measure that? Oh, very good, okay. Uh, hand up there and then we'll take a few questions on this side, yes. Uh, my name is C. Omar Kebe. I'm from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, I'm coming from this perspective um, in terms of the government and what sorts of data are available. Um, with the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, we are using data from the IRS, Statistics of Income, the 990 filings, and also the Foundation Center for U.S. Foundations, supplemented by the um, uh, USAID Volage Report. This is the report on voluntary organizations. I'm wondering if there are other data sources that we may be missing that you guys are using for your report. Okay. Thank you. We'll take a couple more questions here and then the panelists can respond. I think one hand back. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, I'm Norm Curlin from the Center for Economic and Social Justice. Now, I have a question in terms of the children around the world who are now poor. Uh, being able to put in a position where they can engage in global philanthropy. And, there, and the reason for the question, and these were things I, I wanted to pose to the first two speakers, uh, is that uh, in the UN's Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 17, says that every person should be able to be an owner, just as David was an, is an owner, and, and, and yet no nation in the world has laws which make that possible, particularly the monetary systems and the tax systems. But it is possible. There are ideas out there for changing the system. And I'm wondering what you panelists would have in addressing that. Absolutely. So we'll take just uh, one last question at the back there and then let the panelists yeah. respond. Natalie Leo with Voice of America. Um, some civil society or NGO groups in authoritarian societies tend not to uh, want to register officially or in some instances are not allowed to register officially. I was wondering what um, your thoughts are on helping them. Absolutely. Okay. Now we have, uh, I know there are a lot more questions that we didn't answer, but we will have a reception following the panel and you'll have, I'm sure our panelists would be happy to um, be available to answer any remaining questions. So we'll just take very short comments in response to some of the questions that have been posed. Let's start with Carol. Yes. And I'll keep mine short and please let's, uh, for on the, from the Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, we measure, you know, just the global philanthropy, and I, you're probably asking about both, the domestic and the global. And I, I would, I'd be happy to, I, let me email you our whole description of the sources that we went to so that we could get a more robust number. Because actually for our global philanthropy number for the U.S., we have a, a higher number than you all collect, because we go right to the sources. And I'm happy to, I'm so happy you're here, because I'd love for you to see these sources. So. See me and give me your email and I'll, <laughs> I'll do it that way. <laughs> Good. And then the other one that I wanted to respond to, I think, how do you change that? I mean, it's just all these things. I, I, I think it's the, the data and it is just really promoting that culture and um, in, in your society and getting celebrity figures out there. I, I, you know, when you watch any sports game, you've always got a celebrity basketball player, football player, whatever, talking about what they're doing for charity. And I think that those types of 
things are really, really important. So I'll answer the, or respond to the comment about unregistered organizations. And it's true that under international law, you can't be required to incorporate, to register your organization. If you want to get together with friends and talk about politics or sports or anything else, you can't be forced to register. Yet governments that are more authoritarian in nature actually do impose a mandatory registration requirement. Why do they do that? Because then they can control. They know what you're up to, and then they can impose all sorts of requirements about reporting, uh, obligations in terms of government oversight, and so forth. So that's one of the touchstone issues in terms of ease of operating. It's not just the ease of operating a formal group, but one of the indicators we look at is, do you actually have to register in the first place? Okay, Paris, too. Yeah, you'll just... take the toughest questions, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, Carol and uh, Doug have answered most of them. I would just add on the question about reports that OECD recently released um, their long-anticipated um, philanthropy for development report, an update from 2003, and it's quite rich with a lot of data, um, and also um, obviously giving uh, USA, um, which is uh, an important um, report in the sector for in the US. So I would uh, recommend you look into those. Um, to the question about citizens as owners, um, it's a great question, and I'd love to learn from you perhaps after what some of those ideas are. Um, I was personally drawn to philanthropy. You know, my area of expertise is the Middle East, and I um, was very disheartened by the dependencies that the aid architecture system had created in many of these countries, and really thought that these pockets of wealth in, in these countries, if these philanthropists or private sector individuals were closer to the ground and had a better understanding of their local country context, then they could somehow do it better and get it right. I'm not as optimistic as I used to be, <laughs> but I'm still optimistic. And so um, I, I see your point and would, would love to uh, continue the conversation after. Wonderful. Well, um, I just have one last point, and that's on the philanthropy education. I don't think we addressed that. And I think you're correct that today we have so many more resources and tools. The Lilly Family School, for example, has produced many reports on how children learn about philanthropy. In fact, one was just released earlier this year. And the power of conversations with your children in particular in terms of raising the next generation of philanthropists. So I encourage you to look at our website. We have lots of reports and um, resources and tools on philanthropic conversations and engaging young philanthropists and young donors. So I just point you in that direction. Please join me in thanking our panel. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Um, and they will, um, I'm sure they're happy to have, just hang out for just a few minutes for additional questions. We also have a reception just outside uh, the room and Dean Pasek will uh, close us out. Well, I, I want just one more round of applause for a wonderful panel. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I want to, uh, I just want to share one quick reflection on, on the importance of what Henrietta Force said about the, the founding moment of UNICEF when, when people realized after the end of the Second World War that helping children was a, a, a wonderful thing to do and the whole founding of the U, UN created so much uh, international solidarity and curiosity and new forms of knowledge. And, and I hope through through the conversations we've started here today, that was the point of the Global Index is to, I think, create these generative conversations to show what an innovative yet messy place philanthropy is. And, and you saw how philanthropy is helping to kind of revive um, um, a kind of a legacy uh, institution like UNICEF. So I want to thank you all for being with us. I want to thank um, the Hudson Institute, Carol, Paris to Doug, Una, thank you for your leadership. Uh, Sean. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sean, and your, your colleagues. I want to thank um, uh, Amy Conley, Adrian Kaluger, and Kathy Kerrigan and our staff, who brought a little bit of global wisdom uh, from the heartland to the nation's capital. And, and uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and uh, please join us for a reception so we can continue our conversations. Thank you very much.